it. Um, so for me, if you're asking me, I would say college was the hardest and then med school and then residency, which is not the most like it is an unpopular opinion is what I'll say, because you'll hear the opposite. So the more compassion you maintain, the less burnout you're going to be. You'll feel tired for sure. Like anyone who's working 70, 80 hours is going to feel tired. At the end of the day, like at least you feel, for me, at least I feel fulfilled. Being medicine for the right reasons, um, not for prestige or wealth or status, because they're not going to sustain you in this broken healthcare system. As everyone mentioned, I'm a uh, second year internal medicine resident. Um, I kind of wanted to just share my journey from first generation college graduate to now a physician. And some, a lot of people know me as at Kelly Takes Medicine on, from my Instagram. So. so a little bit about me. Um, this is already briefly mentioned, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, neither of my parents went to college. And my parents both had me super young and I was actually raised by my grandparents. Um, we, I lived with my aunt and uncle, my two cousins, and then my grandparents. Um, and then I went to UC Irvine for college. I majored in biological sciences and then went to medical school in Richmond, Virginia. And that was considered like a mid-tier medical school. And then after that, I came back to California to do residency near my hometown. Well, close enough. Uh, UCLA, I feel like, is 30 miles-ish from Anaheim. So I'm really close to my family, which I'm happy about. Um, and then I did apply for the National Health Service Course Scholarship. And so I'm doing... So in return for paying for my medical school tuition after residency, I'm going to be paying them back in service as a primary care physician in like an underserved, under-resourced uh, clinic. And then I always like to talk about diversity. That's super important to me. Um, I like to talk about first gens because I think that even though, so a lot of first gens are Latinx or your traditional Black or African-American uh, minority, there are also other first gens who come from lower income families, you know, who come from immigrant families that may not be captured. And so that's something I like to talk about, especially on social media to kind of inspire people that, you know, you can become a doctor, even if none of your parents were, you know, went to college. Um, and so 11, only 11.2% of medical school applicants, or sorry, not applicants, matriculants. So people who actually end up going to medical school are first gen um, and then the other interesting aspect that I didn't realize was that Southeast Asian applicants too, like Vietnamese, Hmong, Filipino, they also apply at pretty low rates to medical school. And I think, you know, it kind of makes sense because when I think about like female Vietnamese doctors, I think there are some in my neighborhood, but I, I think when you go outside of California, there's not many. <laughs> and then as you know, as an ally to my Black and Latinx colleagues, I think it's important because even though we are an Asian minority, I think we still have some privilege that comes with that. And so I do like to elevate, you know, my colleagues who don't have that same privilege that we do. And so this is just to emphasize like only 10% of applicants are Black or African-American and then 12% are Latinx, which is actually on the rise, which is, I think, very good for all of us. And the bottom line is that a lot of our patients do better and live longer. And research shows that this is true when their doctors look like them. And so, um, and just, you know, to say like anyone can become a doctor, even if, you know, you don't see a doctor that looks like you, it's still possible. And then briefly from my journey, I actually was pre-pharmacy and this kind of goes into, because my parents were doctors and Interestingly, a lot of Vietnamese people are pharmacists. And so my family, we had a lot of Vietnamese, like a lot of pharmacists that were, you know, friends that we were friends with. And they were like, you should become a pharmacist. And so naturally I was like, okay, sure. Like, that's the thing that we do. Like, I'm going to become a pharmacist <laughs> uh, because I didn't think that anything else was possible. Like, I didn't really have any doctors in my family, obviously. Um, and so I went to college thinking I was going to do pharmacy school. And then literally, I think two months before, uh, I was shattering a pharmacist and like she kind of, I think saw a spark in me that I didn't even see myself because I didn't really have the confidence. And so she's like, I think you should apply to medical school since you're so interested in geriatrics and medicine. And so like 
I listened to this pharmacist advice and ended up doing it. And then kind of now I'm here. <laughs> like, and so I, because I decided so late, I had to take two growth years is what I like to call it instead of gap years. And I just spent those two years building up my experience, kind of some of the things that I did. Um, I worked as a medical scribe at first, you know, family clinic. And then I started scribing for this mobile geriatric clinic. And so, and then for those of you who are like unfamiliar yet, geriatrics is just this a specialty for caring for older people over 65. Um, and then I worked as a medical assistant as well at uh, a family medicine clinic in near my hometown where we mainly serve like Medicaid, low-income patients, um, and then like the Latinx community. And then I went to work as a medical assistant for a federally qualified health center, which is like basically a federally funded low-income clinic. And that one was for like um, Chinese, Taiwanese immigrants. And then I volunteered a lot in in uh, older adult living communities, like assisted living communities. So these are like kind of what you traditionally think of as your senior homes, the people who just live there, you know, have this little community. And so I pretty much was like a friendly visitor. I would just spend time keeping people company because as you know, a lot of older people are very lonely and, you know, all their friends and family have died or like their wife's died. And, you know, so they're pretty lonely. And that was very rewarding for me. And then I also shadowed uh, quite a bit. I shadowed like emergency medicine. Didn't really like it. I did some research, also didn't really like it. Um, and then also family medicine and internal medicine were like the two specialties I was drawn to. So that's kind of before med school. Um, and then, so becoming a doctor, so it's four years of college and then four years of medical school. And then I, I'll briefly talk about the NHFC, but um, you're supposed to apply both, like if you want all four years to be covered, you apply the year that you got accepted to medical school. And because then it gets, it goes into effect the following year. And then if you so for me, I actually applied the first year of medical school. So I have three years paid for, for, for my tuition. And then in return, how many, many years that you want the scholarship to pay for your tuition, you just pay back in service, which to me is like, was the best of both worlds. Cause I wanted to do primary care already. And I want to work with under-resourced communities already. So like the scholarship is like perfect for that. Um, and then I can answer more questions about that later if you guys want to know more about it. And then so after medical school, you do residency and residency is very variable. So the minimum is three years. So internal medicine, which is what I'm doing, is three years minimum. And then if you want to specialize, so you can do so internal medicine is kind of the pathway you take if you want to subspecialize in like an organ system. For example, like a cardiologist is like probably the most common, but you you go, you do that through internal medicine and then you do like an extra three years of cardiology fellowship on top of the three years of residency. Um, and then I think emergency medicine is also three years. Pediatrics is also three years. And the five years would be like OBGYN, general surgery, and then seven years would be the longest, which is plastic surgery or neurosurgery. And then this is just like not without specializing. So for for example, if you're trying to be like a vascular surgeon, you do five years of general surgery and then you do like extra training on top of that to like self-specialize in general surgery. Um, so it's kind of a little complicated, um, but three years is like the minimum that you should remember. And then after internal medicine, I, for, for example, I'm going to do geriatrics and probably probably palliative care. And so that'll be extra two years after I'm done with residency. And so it is, yeah, it is a lot of training, I will say, if you're trying to self-specialize. And I think, you know, the more you specialize, the more you get paid. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave that at that. Um, I think I get this question a lot. It's like, what is the hardest part of your journey? I think it really depends on who you ask. I feel like first gens are built a little bit different because we had to kind of, because no one in your family has gone to college before, like your hardest part of your journey is going to college. Like that's the hardest. And we had to kind of put that work up, that hard work up front. So like medical school was like not that hard for me <laughs> because I already knew how to study. And I already knew like, like medical school is just like college, except a little bit accelerated like your exams are not once every three months your exams are like once every one to two weeks you know so it's just like a little bit like on steroids like the the work you put 
Um, so for me, if you're asking me, I would say college was the hardest and then med school and then residency, which is not the most like it is an unpopular opinion is what I'll say, because you'll hear the opposite. You'll hear residency is the hardest and then med school and then college. Some people will say medical school and residency were like kind of similar. Um, and so like that's why that's why I say like, you know, first gens are built a little bit different because the, the struggles that you go with are like different parts of your life. Like if you're someone who is, you know, come from more wealthy, privileged like family, college and math school is not that hard for you, you know, and then you come residency where you have to like, you know, work your butt off and it's just like a little bit of different pace that you're not used to. Um, and I think, yeah, college was hard because you just had to navigate completely on your own. You don't have like a blueprint or a map. And then medical school is hard because you have to constantly perform and you're under a lot of pressure and everyone's always evaluating you. You're studying a ton. You're studying at least five to eight hours every day. Um, it's like a full-time, your full-time job is to study, like that is your job. So like you can't work during medical school. Um, you have these uh, USMLE exams. They're like uh, United States licensing exams. And if you're in DO school, you have to take the DO equivalent of the USMLE, which is called the Comlex. Um, so you're doing two exams. And then residency, it's hard because your lives are at stake, or not your life, but your patient's lives are at stake. And then you're working a lot, like 78, 80 hours a week. And 80s is like the max, like legally allowed. And back then, like you were working 100 hours a week. And and this is why we we're called residents is because we used to live and reside in the hospital to, to work this amount. Um, and so I think, so it's totally understandable, right? Why residency would sound the hardest. Um, but it's like hard in a different way. It's just like, you're not under you have more responsibility you're more you're an adult now you like kind of have to get the hang of life um and so yeah like I said most people would say residency is about the same as med school and those are both harder than college um and then I want to talk a little bit about internal medicine because I feel like a lot of people don't know I don't think I understood what internal medicine was until medical school <laughs> when I was looking into specialties to apply to um, I will say it is similar to family medicine, except you're only working with adults and you don't have to do OBGYN training and you don't work with kids. And then the last part is that you're more working in the hospital. And so otherwise you're kind of general medicine, jack of all trades outside emergencies. Cause I think ED docs are also jack of all trades, but in an emergency setting, um, so we're the ones that take care of people when you get in there to the hospital. So like if your mom has heart failure and she goes to the hospital, the ED sees them and then the ED calls us and say, hey, we're going to like admit this patient to you. And then like we take care of them. We're like coordinating their care, kind of their primary, the primary team for them. We call specialists if we need to and kind of coordinate everything. Um, and then through internal medicine, which is here's like another difference between family and internal medicine is that. You can be a hospitalist, so you can be the ones working in the hospital, and then you can also be a primary care physician if you want. And then back in the old days, we would do both. So we would see patients, you know, in clinic, and then when they get admitted to the hospital, we would follow them. Um, now it's really hard to do that in today's healthcare system, so you have to pick one. Um, there's still people who do both, and I actually want to do both because I feel like. For me, when I'm in the clinic too long, I start to miss being in the hospital. And then when I'm, when I'm in the hospital for too long, I start to miss being in the clinic. And so I really like both. And there is a way to do that. You have to like be at an academic center like UCLA that gives you flexibility in your contract to do both. Um, the other thing I'll say is, yeah, you're pretty much like the patient's quarterback. Like you make all the calls, like you decide, you know, who you want to pass the ball to. Like if there's something that you're really having a hard time managing like this patient's heart failure is not getting better. Like, okay, I better call the cardiologist to help me out here. Um, and then through internal medicine, as I mentioned briefly before, is how you self-specialize. So once you self-specialize, you're no longer able to practice hospital or primary care medicine because you're not a generalist anymore. Like you've chosen your organ, like you're going to be, uh, you know, a gut GI doctor or like a renal doctor and, and, um, and so on and so forth. And then a little bit about my schedule. It, it does vary by residency program. Believe it or not, even though we work 70 to eight hours a week, UCLA is like, like the least, I don't know, I would say less hard than a lot of programs. Like 
it's the fortunate part about residency is that there are people who are breaking duty hours all the time and you're kind of in a, in a tough spot because like if you report the program then that means you don't have a job and going through residency like going through the whole match process again is is incredibly taxing and so I think that's something to think about in the way you know in the future way ahead is like which program we are going to and so my schedule is not terrible. Um, the backbone is that majority of my training is um, in the hospital. So I do four weeks of hospital at a time. And then I do two weeks of clinic or outpatient um, time. Um, so I have primary care clinic and then other subspecialty clinics that we rotate at too. Um, and like, like cardiology, we spend a little bit of time in nephrology too. Um, and then all the internal medicine residents are trained in primary care. Um, so even if you want to be a hospitalist, like when you're in residency, you're still getting training in primary care, uh, in primary care clinic. Um, and then the quality of the experiences varies too. Like I'm very thankful that I'm in the primary care track. So the curriculum is well thought out and the quality of our experiences is pretty high and strong. And I'm convinced that if everybody did the primary care track, they would want to do primary care because it's so great. Um, and it's just so well run. And then some IM programs have, um, I already said this, yeah. So we have one, UCSF has one, University of Colorado has one too. Um, so if definitely if you're thinking primary care through the internal medicine route, um, I would apply to primary care tracks. Um, and then our inpatient rotations, um, so inpatient means in the hospital, outpatient means outside the hospital. Um, so we, we also do cardi like cardiac care unit, ICU, um, and then we also do oncology and then general wards, um, which is like, again, like where we take care of patients who are admitted overnight in the hospital. Um, yeah, I kind of mentioned this already. Inpatient, 70 to 80 hours a week. Outpatient, 50 hours a week is probably like the average for us. Um, life in the hospital, let me check the time. I want to be mindful of the time. Okay. Um, so as the resident physician, me, um, so that's going to be any doctor who is an MD or DO. Um, and then we are supervised by who we call an attending physician. So they're, they're kind of the boss and they just oversee everything. And um, I typically arrive around 6 a.m. and then kind of get sign out from the overnight team. So they're the ones that watch our patients overnight when we, and then we get to go home. And so I, in the morning I come and I, you know, just ask them, okay, like what happened to patients overnight? Anything, you know, did someone like have cardiac arrest? Hopefully not. Um, things like that. And then I go see my patients starting like seven and then I see them. I wish I could spend more time with them. It's just really hard because we're like doing a lot of different tasks. But I spend about five to 10 minutes on each patient. Um, you have about the max that you can carry as a resident is 10. So you have, or sorry, as an intern is 10, as a resident is 20. So now it's 20. Um, and then at around 9 a.m., um, you round with the attending. Um, and then you kind of go over your plans with each patient uh, that you have for each patient. And then after that, you're doing your to do's, like your tasks. Like if you have a patient that you need to call like the GI doctor for, you call them and tell them about the patient, what, help, what you need help with, you answer pages. It's just like a lot of different things you're doing and like the nurses are paging you or like another patient wants to leave, you have to go talk to them. And it's just like kind of putting out, it just feels like you're putting out fires all the time. <laughs> Um, and then 12 p.m., hopefully you have time for lunch. Um, at lunchtime, we have what we call conference. So it's, you know, we just eat lunch while we learn like about a case or a different topic, reviewing how to manage like asthma or COPD or something. Um, and then if you are on call, um, you are admitting new patients. So between one to five, like you'll get pages from the ED, like, hey, we have a patient for you that needs to stay overnight. They need like more workup, more tests for something. Um, and so you're like going to see those patients, talking to them, doing the exam, ordering tests and all of that. And hopefully by like 5 p.m., it depends. So there's short call, there's medium call, there's long call, the schedule's all different. Um, I won't go into the details because that's way more you need to way more than you need to know. And also it's going to be different by hospital. 
but you leave around like, I don't know, normally I leave around seven. So I would say it's like a, about a 12 hour shift normally. Yeah. I think the longest I ever worked was probably like 18 hours. Um, but very rarely is my shift less than like 12 hours in the inpatient hospital setting. Um, and then life in clinic, sorry, actually, let me clarify. So this is the day in the life for like an intern. Now that I'm a resident, I'm like a senior resident. So like, I actually don't see every single patient because I, it's just impossible to see like 20 patients at a time. Um, so, so the interns are like the ones that are like presenting to me first, they like run their plan by me. And then I just prepare them for rounds and make sure that they're ready to present like talk about their plan with the attending. So, so like the senior resident, you kind of, it's a little bit nicer because you don't get as many pages. You don't have to write all the notes anymore. You're just like overseeing. Um, so it's kind of like once like um, different levels. So like for, so that you, it's just safer so that the intern has someone looking over their work and then you have someone looking over your work, which would be, which would be like the attending. And then clinic is the same regardless of whether you're first, second, or third year resident and in internal medicine. So it is your typical eight to five, which is very nice. And we will read up on our patients the night before. And what's nice about like primary care clinic is like, these are your patients. These are, this is your panel. If for example, you meet a patient in the hospital and they don't have a primary care doctor, you can give them your card and recruit them to your clinic. And that's actually like one of my favorite parts of being like, um, you know, being able to do both hospital and primary care clinic medicine. Cause then you know all about them. Like you can see what they were like in the hospital and then see them in your clinic and see how they're doing. So that's really rewarding. Um, and you just go see your patients independently, you examine them independently, um, and then you come back, you tell your attending, okay, this is what's happening, this is like what my plan is, and they say, okay, or they have like something to add, and then you just go back to your patient and you just tell them what the plan is. Um, and then I think some special features of like the UCLA primary care program is like, we do a lot of community service, we do a lot of home visits, um, we have like a substance use disorder clinic, and then we have a special primary care medicine week where it's two weeks where you're just purely learning about primary care and you have less clinic and you have like um, activities that you do together. You go out into the community. And so we're like UCLA is trying to be better at like addressing social determinants of health and then also making sure we're like engaging with the community, which is super important because in primary care, if you're going to serve your community, you should get to know the community and see what their strengths are, as well as like what you can help with. Um, and then I think, I think it'd be fun to just kind of like walk all of you through like how a doctor things. I chose like a super simple case because I like I think it's would be overwhelming <laughs> to go through like a hard case. Um, but this is like an example of like how we would you know take care of a patient. So. And this is in the, in the hospital setting. So like we're in the hospital, you get a page from the ED and they say, hey, we have a 78 year old male. He lost consciousness. We want to admit him overnight to further like figure out why he's he passed out. Um, and just so you know, his CT head was negative for any like stroke or like brain bleed. Um, and then what we first do is like, even before you go see the patient, um, you think about, a, what we call a differential diagnosis, like what are the all the possibilities that could be uh, contributing to this patient's loss of consciousness, or the medical term would be uh, syncope. So while, while I'm walking to the ED, I think about all, all these things, and I pull up like resources, like, you know, I can't memorize everything, but you try to have a framework. And so um, you have resources that you can like look up really quick, like, okay, differential diagnosis for syncope. And then like, this is kind of my framework. So I'm thinking, okay, is this patient having like this, a TIA is just like a term for like a mini stroke where the, sh the symptoms are temporary and transient. So it doesn't last long, but it is because there's like a decreased blood flow in the, in the brain um, that isn't like a full stroke, but just like temporary. Um, and then I also think about the heart. Like, did this person have an abnormal heart rhythm that just like, you know, made them lose consciousness? Did they, or did they have orthostatic hypotension, which is when your blood pressure can't increase 
um, in time when you go from like sitting to standing. And I feel like sometimes we have this happen to us when we get up too fast and our blood pressure just can't um, go up high enough, uh, quick enough. And then sometimes there's like a abnormal uh, valve in your heart that kind of gets that makes you pass out when you're exercising there's like more blood flow to to the through the valve and then the valve is already so narrowed or what we call stenosed and so you pass out because like the valve isn't like getting enough allowing enough blood flow to to get through when you're exercising and then there's something called like a clot in the lung which is like a pulmonary embolism or a pe um and then you're just thinking about all these things and then i walk in the room and then I'm like, okay, this is what I want to ask to like narrow down the differential diagnosis. Like, so normally I start with open-ended questions. Um, if you give a patient like two minutes to and you don't interrupt them and you let them talk, they'll like give you a sense of like what's happening already. But let's say like, maybe they're not doing that. Um, I always want to ask like, in this case, okay, was it sudden or did you have like a prodrome? Like you had some kind of like, like funny sensation that happened right before you passed out. Um, because if it's sudden, that makes me think that it's probably more related to the heart because in the heart, you're not really, everything is just happening suddenly. Like you're not getting, your heart's not getting a warning that this is happening. Um, so if it's sudden, it makes me think that they're having an abnormal heart rhythm. If they're feeling warm or dizzy right before they passed out, then that makes me think that it's like basal vagal or like kind of either orthostatic hypotension or just something um, related to like the body's it like abnormal response to like the situation. For example, sometimes people, this is a little bit weird, but sometimes like older people when they're like straining during like a bowel movement, like they're pooping and they're straining very hard, it that increase in pressure in the body decreases the, like the blood flow to the brain. So like they can actually like just feel like they're passing out. Um, and then if they've had a heart attack before and they have blockages in their heart, then it's possible and likely that they have blockages in the brain that would make me think like they could have a transient uh, ischemic attack or a TIA. And then, and I also want to ask like, okay, new blood pressure medications because blood pressure decreases your blood pressure, right? Um, so if they're taking too much, then maybe they're passing out because their dose is too high or something. Um, so this is like what I asked. It's very targeted. So you always think of like a differential first. And then that way, when you go in, you ask questions that make one diagnosis uh, more likely than the other. And then there's another thing that doctors are trained to do is like likelihood ratios. And so like, it's basically, there's like numbers and um, there's research to that studies how likely a diagnosis is based on a symptom or an exam finding. For example, patients with heart failure, like we always listen to the lungs and there's crackles. Like crackles is very non-specific. Like it doesn't tell you that they have heart failure or not. Like crackles in the lungs can be from asthma. It could be from just not exercising your lungs too much and, you know, being in bed all day. And so it's not very helpful. Um, but if they're saying, I have to sleep with five pillows at night, um, that's called orthopnea. I have to sleep with five pillows or else I'm just very short of breath at nighttime. Um, and that is actually very sensitive. Um, like the presence of that makes the diagnosis of heart failure more likely. And so you want to ask questions that are like helpful for like diagnosing something. Um, and then this is kind of what I mean by like a framework or we call the, these schemas. This is from like a podcast that I like to listen to, to like exercise my brain, but um, they go through, this is like the differential for syncope. And so you kind of have like a framework every time you go in there um, and you don't have to memorize all this. It's just for you to like have an idea of what you want to ask. And so this is like what I would pull up on the way to seeing the patient. That way I kind of know what to ask. And then um, I kind of skipped over the exam, but exam is important, the physical exam, but it's, like I said, not very helpful unless you know what to look for. For example, like I listen to the lungs. I just do that to do that, but it, it doesn't change like what I'm going to do. Like if I hear crackles, I'm like, okay, maybe they have heart failure, but, but that the most important is like the actual diagnosis and like the testing. Um, and so for this patient who's having syncope, I, they already got brain imaging and their CT head was normal. Um, and then I want to get an echocardiogram to see if there's any abnormal heart valves. And then I want to get 
ask the nurse, or I can do it too. Uh, orthostatic vitals. So you check their blood pressure from laying down to sitting to standing. And then if it um, your blood pressure drops while you're standing, that means that the flow is not getting to your brain. And that's probably why you're passing out. And then there's another thing called telemetry, which is we put the heart monitor on them. And then we just wash and it's just like continuous, like 24 hours. And then the next day you can always like pull up the report and then you can see like, okay, did they have any like abnormal heart rhythms like overnight that could explain why they're passing out. Um, so that's what, that's like everything that I would order for this patient. And then, so again, it's, you want to have a good reason for ordering a test. Like you, a lot of times there's people who do like a shotgun approach um, and medical schools are training us not to do that. So a shotgun approach is like, let's just send all these tests, right? Like, let's just send everything under the sun. And if something comes back positive, great. Um, it's not like, first of all, it's like a waste of resources. And then second of all, it's like, you kind of want to always know what to do with the test when it comes back positive, because if every, and you want to make sure you're not missing anything and anchoring on anything. Um, for example, if I sent a bunch of tests and then something came back, that was like wrong with their liver. Um, but then now I'm like, okay, now I have to deal with this, but I don't think it's relevant to like why they're passing out. Um, and then obviously if it's like really bad, like their liver enzyme is very abnormal, then I'll like, you know, we'll look into it. But if it's like slightly high, it could be like from so many different things. Like this person could be, you know, drinking or they could have a fatty liver, but it's like, we're not going to do anything with that in the hospital because it's not like an urgent thing. Like we can have them follow up with their primary care doctor, get an ultrasound or liver. Like it's nothing that's like life-threatening and it just tends to cause more problems when you're doing the shotgun approach. Um, and so the thing about sensitivity and specificities is also super important because if you're getting a test that is not very sensitive, like it doesn't pick up the disease, then you probably don't want to order that. Um, but you you can order a test that's very specific because if it's positive, then great. That means that you're very certain that this person has this disease. Um, and then the treatment, for example, like if this patient had, this is like a totally made up patient, by the way. Um, <laughs> if this patient had a third degree heart block, um, then they would need a pacemaker. So I have to call a cardiologist, tell them that, okay, this patient has this, like we need a pacemaker. Um, sometimes they're just dehydrated. Like they are just hypovolemic. That's why they're orthostatic. That's why their blood pressure isn't increasing as high as it should when they're standing. Um, so you, they just need to drink more water and it's a simple fix. Like it's, you know, we just give them a little bit of IV fluids to help them and then send them home on their way and then stop any medications. Like if they were started on a really high dose of a blood pressure medication, then I want to stop it. So that's kind of our thinking process. Um, and then I kind of wanted to pivot a little bit in terms of like the bigger picture and, you know, our, my impact as a physician, what I want my impact to be. I started the Endodox mentorship program um, because I felt like there were a lot of mentorship programs out there, but nothing super like targeted to people who are first gen, um, as well as your traditional underrepresented minorities. And there's also like very narrow definition. So like the underdogs, we use the UCSF definition. So it includes Southeast Asians and includes like Hmong, Native American, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian. And, you know, I think, I think it's um, important to capture everybody, you know, because I think, again, it's just, we just need more representation. Like it's, better for the patients and it's better for, you know, general medicine as a whole to just have a diverse workforce. Um, and then I want my impact to also be like mentoring, like the future, because I feel like there's a lot of burnout, a lot of people who are going into medicine for the wrong reasons. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, people know what they're getting themselves into. Um, and then addressing social determinants of health on like a patient level. I think a lot of times we get overwhelmed, like there's all these patients who are poor, low income, like what am I supposed to do as like the doctor, right? Like you don't have to save the world overnight. Like you just pick one patient, you know, for that week. Like I have, you know, one patient I'm thinking about is like, like I, this, my goal this week is just to help this one patient. Um, I just wanted to help them find, you know, a food pantry so that they can afford their meals and, you know, help it might help their diabetes a little bit. Um, and then I think educating through social media, I feel like social media is going to be like the next 
big, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but it's very powerful. And I feel like it can reach a lot of people in, in a positive way, especially if you use it in the right way. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping my impact to be, like educating people on primary care and like the various different issues, which I think I have a slide here. Um, I think I misplaced the slide, but <laughs> this is gonna be such a weird, okay. Like in case anyone was curious about what I'm doing in primary care clinic, this is what I do. Chronic conditions, mental health, preventative health, and the new acute or subacute conditions, kind of a little bit of everything. Um, it's much more laid back. Um, sorry for misplacing this slide. Okay, um, that kind of back to what I was talking about. Um, I think there's just a lot of challenges to being a doctor. Um, like patients aren't like a textbook, like you learn about heart failure and like heart failure, they have all these symptoms. And, um, but sometimes like you meet a patient and they don't have any of the symptoms. Like for example, older people with heart attacks, like their main symptom is not chest pain. It's like, I feel nauseous or my, my jaw hurts, you know, it's like something random. And then, um, and sometimes patients have a lot of things happening at one time and very, they're very complicated. Like, and it's really hard to figure out what is causing their, their main issue. Um, and sometimes patients don't want to be treated. Like you can say, I recommend all these things, but patient can be like, nope, I don't want that. And it's hard to, you know, take no for an answer. We have to respect their autonomy. And if they don't want it, then there's nothing you can do. You, of course, you try to figure out why they don't want it. Um, and then a lot of times families want something to be done, but it's not appropriate. And like the most common one is like procedures for it, like a G-tube, like a patient who has dementia, and they're not eating. Um, and honestly, like this is actually part of the dying process. It's like you stop wanting food that like, you don't eat anymore. Like a lot of patients with cancer will lose their appetite because like their body is dying. And so they want a G2 to prolong their life. And, you know, that's not very appropriate. And so like you have to deal with that. Um, and then tests aren't perfect. So kind of like what I said, it's really hard to be a doctor sometimes because we have a test, like for example, like an ANA is like a screening test for lupus and other autoimmune conditions. And it's sensitive, meaning it'll capture like everything. Like it'll, if it's positive, then this patient could have lupus or this patient could have Sjogren's. They could have literally any autoimmune condition um, if it's positive, but it's not very helpful, right? Like, what do you do? Um, and then you can send more tests. And then sometimes the test is not sensitive, but it's specific. For example, if this person's, you know, this is a antibody that people with lupus have. If this came back positive, then great. It's a slam dunk, they have lupus. But if it was negative, that doesn't mean that they don't have lupus. Like that means we have to keep digging. And like, it's very challenging to like, you know, have tests that aren't perfect. Um, and sometimes we just don't know. And, you know, it's okay. Like doctors don't know everything. Like even now, like we, things that we know now, we didn't know back then. And so back then people just didn't know. And that's like how it's going to be all the time. Like we don't know things right now, but maybe in 10 years we'll know. And we have to be okay with that. Sometimes it's hard to let go of that um, feeling, you know, to that you don't know everything. And then unfortunately, like as a doctor, your patients will die. It's, it's the circle of life and we can't fix everyone, even though we want to, like we can't always be the hero. Um, and so I think that's a challenging part of, of being a doctor too. Um, I want to take a moment to kind of talk about what I feel like are the most pressing problems of our time. I think one is the compassion crisis. And so, you know, as a pre-med, as a med student, I had a lot of, I still do. I, I and I wanna like inspire other people to kind of hold on to this fire in them. It's like, you came in to help people and then the system over time breaks you down and your empathy cut, like declines and then you burn out, like you just, like how there's so many patients to take care of and I'm not getting paid enough. And like the system, like, why is it like this? Why can't my patient who doesn't have insurance get the same care, you know? And it's very frustrating. And so a lot of times we're turning our emotions off to like try to deal with this. Um, and then we have started getting, you know, mixed up between the relationship with burnout and compassion. Like we think that if I turn my compassion off, maybe I'll burn out less, but it's actually the opposite of what happens. Um, and I think, and I've had to experience this personally because I like, am very scared of burning out. And so what I do is I just let myself feel everything that I want to feel because that's like what keeps me going. Like I wanted to become a doctor 
for patients. Like I'm not here for the system. Like our system sucks. Like if I, if we all went to medicine because of the system, like, like terrible reason, right? Like we didn't, we're not here because of the system. We're here because of the patients. And so even if the system sucks, I just, there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm not even going to spend a second to think about it. <laughs> um, and I think it's actually the opposite. So the more compassion you maintain, the less burnout you're going to be. You'll feel tired for sure. Like anyone who's working 70, 80 hours is going to feel tired. At the end of the day, like at least you feel, for me, at least I feel fulfilled. Um, and even though I'm saying this from personal like experience, I, there's actually a ton of research that, and I talk about this on social media, there's a ton of research that actually supports this. Like, and they've, you know, done studies of people's brains and like seeing that like people who maintain their compassion are more, more resilient, they burn out less. Um, so I think that's like one of my messages to you all. And then diversity is an issue. I think we need both URMs and first gens. Um, and then not enough primary care doctors or geriatricians. So geriatrics is like a sub specialty of primary care. So you're, you're a primary care physician, but you're taking care of specifically older people. Um, and that's what I want to do. Um, like we all know, like, I think I can't remember 2030, we're going to have more older people than we do children, which is kind of crazy because a lot of patients are older. And the sad part is like, there are not, uh, there are not enough geriatricians to like take care of those people. Um, and there's a lot of complicated people. I mean, this is why a lot of people don't want to take care of older people because they're so complicated. The geriatricians want to take care of those people though. So I think just trying to like inspire and encourage people to like consider geriatrics. Um, and the last thing is, yeah, unfortunately, our American healthcare system is very broken. It's very fragmented. So like, it's not, um, it's, it's very capitalistic. So our system wants to make money. And I think that's the problem. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna end with some pearls of wisdom. Um, so pursuing medicine for the right reason, um, not for prestige or wealth or status, because they're not going to sustain you in this broken healthcare system. And then protecting your compassion at all costs, um, you will need it to remember your calling during the tough times. And then accept what you can't change, so the system. And then tackle what you can, which is your mindset. Um, and then choosing wisely, so like the culture, the medical school you go to, the residency, making sure, making sure they're not toxic for you. And then this is my email. And then I normally answer questions like on Instagram too. So if you want to just message me, that's okay. I, I really encourage, I think it's hard, first of all, to deal with that. And I feel like it took me a long time actually to be able to filter out that background noise and I feel like the most important is to surround yourself with people who are not like that. So I've actually had to like, you know, cut a lot of people out of my life who, you know, and like social media is hard. I feel like like growing up in the time of social media is incredibly hard and it's hard to filter that out. I think that as long as you know who you are and you know your story, you just hold on to that. Like, like so so what if I need financial aid and qualify? Like, I, I think I deserve this. Like, I'm not going to let, you know, a couple of people whose opinions, you know, don't really matter to me. Like, I mean, who's this person? Like, you know, I don't know them and they don't know me. And so you just have to do a lot of filtering out and it's hard. And it's unfortunately not going to happen overnight. It just takes like years and years. Um, I think even now I still struggle with that. So I think just normalizing it, you know, like this is going to happen a lot and the microaggressions will start to add up. And then um, I think therapy helps. So I had to go through a lot of therapy to kind of filter this out. Um, and it's hard because you're, you know, an Asian minority. And so there's a lot of people who are, who will say like, well, you have so much privilege, you know, like you are not black or Latina or, you know, you like, you shouldn't be complaining, you know, like there's a lot of that too. Um, so I think it's just trying to if you cannot remind yourself, have people there who can remind you. Um, and it's not, I know, it's like not the most, the best solution that's, you know, going to happen overnight to fix all of this. It's just, I think it's a process. Um, yeah. And I think hopefully, you know, surrounding yourself, like, I think that's why I started my Instagram is because I want to reach those people, right, who who are also dealing with something similar that I did in the past. And so, 
that's all I have to say about that. 